Our second uh, keynote um, speaker um, today is uh, Dr. Paul Bray. Paul is a clinician scientist um, with a long-time academic interest in bleeding and clotting disorders. Uh, he did his heme onc at UCSF San Francisco and went to Johns Hopkins and then went to, was recruited to Baylor where he established a new thrombosis um, research program and then finally to Thomas Jefferson University where he is the Cardezo Foundation for Hematological Research, the director of that um, program. And, um, but Paul has a, a long, and, uh, well, I shouldn't say long, storied and, and uh, um, a, a fantastic um, um, uh, history of, of leading uh, programs and um, educational programs, mentoring programs, and research programs, and particularly has a wide array of interests um, from the biochemistry of coagulation and uh, bleeding um, and hemostatic systems all right through to genetics and uh, RNA and, and the like. So he's really um, been a, a major player in the field and we're delighted to have him here today. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ed. <clears throat> um, this was a slide I slipped in uh, last night. And I realized <clears throat> that for 25 years I've been giving this lecture to Hemong fellows and residents and students and uh, on uh, the overview of hemostasis. And when I get to the coagulation section, this is the slide I've been using for 25 years. And I thought uh, it would be appropriate to show and uh, all the more reason I'm really honored to be here at the Earl Davy uh, Symposium. And I'd also like to thank Ed for, and the organizers for inviting me and uh, Mira for the logistics of getting me here. She might be outside counting coffee proceeds, I'm not sure. Um, uh, so this is the title of my talk. <clears throat> um, I have no disclosures. I want to start by acknowledging the people who, whose work I will, I will present. And let's see, where's my point? I have a pointer. So it, it really began, oh, 10 years or so ago. And in the black font are people that were involved early on in this work. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is work done primarily by Frederick de Norm and Robert Campbell. Uh, in, in collaboration with Mary Cushman at the University of Vermont. And then at the end, uh, I think I'll have time to just show a little bit of a hint of, of, of something that we're trying to uh, do with a group at WashU. Today, I will give you a little background. I shouldn't have to tell you that stroke is important, but will anyway. A um, little background on protease activated receptors and platelet neutrophil interactions in stroke. I'm going to spend a little time on this reagent we generated, which are humanized PAR4 mouse lines. Um, and then finally, how a variant in the PAR4 thrombin receptor <clears throat> affects stroke and antiplatelet drugs outcome in stroke. And then I think there's time for a few implications at the end. So stroke. Everybody knows it's important. None of us wants to have one of these. There's 700,000 ischemic strokes in the U.S. every year with 170,000 deaths. Now, not everybody dies, which is why we have 6 million survivors of stroke with a substantial morbidity, obviously. Higher incidence and worse outcome in black individuals. I'm going to use the term black throughout uh, for a variety of reasons, we could talk about it later if you want, but um, uh, black and white individuals um, self-identified as such. Uh, a word or two about pathophysiology. Um, there's an, a, a strong ischemic component uh, via platelet thrombi when one has a stroke, an ischemic stroke. And then there's a complex ischemia reperfusion injury. Uh, when there is reperfusion after the ischemic event. Treatment is not great. Um, 
in an acute stroke, people attempt to revascularize with recombinant TPA or thrombectomy, uh, and that intuitively makes a lot of sense, right? Restore blood flow. However, that reperfusion also causes a complex injury. <clears throat> and there's no treatment for that injury. Uh, we, tr we try to prevent recurrent stroke with antiplatelet therapy, and you know, we'll get into that a little more later. But it's a marginal benefit. Maybe 20% uh, of people are benefited by antiplatelet therapy uh, after stroke. Now, we're focusing a little bit on the platelet neutrophil interaction that is uh, central to the ischemic stroke injury. Uh, in vivo, platelets are known to play a critical role in both the ischemic phase and neutrophil migration in the reperfusion phase. This is a cartoon uh, of platelet neutrophil interaction. Many of you are quite familiar with some of these molecules in the middle, P-selectin binding to PSGL1, glycoprotein 1B alpha binding to MAC1. But there are other interactions when neutrophils release cathepsin G, which uh, uh, activates platelets, and then activated platelets will put PS on their surface, and there's a yet not well identified receptor on neutrophils for a PS. Once you make, generate PS, as you know, that uh, favor is prothrombotic and it favors thrombin generation, which feeds back onto thrombin receptors, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And this generates a platelet thrombus. Uh, neutrophils release neutrophil extracellular traps. Um, Altogether, you get ischemia and brain infarct through a combination of thrombosis and net formation. Uh, nets are neurotoxic, and so is ROS, and ultimately you wind up with neurologic dysfunction. The initial goal was to identify platelet genes that might contribute to this process. And <clears throat> about 10 years ago, we published this paper where we uh, studied 70 black individuals, 84 white, did platelet aggregation. All these agonists showed no effect of race until we got to PAR4. And uh, you can see there was no difference with PAR4 activation, activating peptides. But there was with, uh, with uh, uh, I'm sorry, no, PAR1 didn't do any, show any difference, PAR4 did. Um, and you see that difference here. We took all the 154 subjects and did a lot of genetic analyses on them, and <clears throat> what you see in this Manhattan plot are a couple of polymorphisms up here with very good p-values showing that they were associated with PAR4 reactivity. That very top one turns out to be a nucleotide change which changed in amino acid in the PAR4 receptor, in the gene that encodes PAR4. This is the same data that's shown up here, but now broken down by genotype. And what you see is that if you're homozygous A, which encodes a threonine, so threonine, threonines, uh, have a higher reactivity than homozygous G, and the heterozygotes are in the middle, and what you'll notice is that the red dots, which are the white subjects, are more often over here, and the black dots are more often over here, but it's not just race. If you'll notice, if you're homozygous G, the black dots, they're, they're down here, and they're not up here. And there's one red dot right there who was white homozygous A. And this is the uh, allele frequency in, in our study where uh, the, the uh, black individuals had a threonine 63% of the time in their alleles. Whites 19 is pretty much reversed by race. 37 versus 81 for the alanine allele. That was our data, and when one looked at the Human Genome Diversity Project, it was similar. And what you see is most people in Europe and Asia had a pie chart that's mostly blue for the alanine, but in sub-Saharan Africa, it's more uh, yellow. 
A word on PAR4 receptors. Most of you know this. For those of you who don't, it's their G protein coupled receptors, seven membrane, transmembrane proteins. When they're not activated, no signal, but when a protease, such as thrombin or cathepsin G or other proteases, bind to the extracellular domain, they cleave off uh, the N terminus, creating a new N terminus, which is now referred to as the tethered ligand, which folds back onto the extracellular domain of the PAR. Now it signals via G proteins. Human platelets express two thrombin receptors, PAR1 and PAR4. The problem with trying to dissect the two is that thrombin activates both of them. But these new pep these peptides that are synthesized from the tethered ligand enable you to uh, probe one receptor and not the other. So since that study, there have been quite a few uh, publications looking at the functional effect of that polymorphism. They're summarized here. There's a number of human platelet studies ex vivo. Compared to the alanine homozygotes, the threonine displayed their platelets, increased aggregation, calcium signaling, granule secretion, thrombus formation under arterial, but not venous shear stress. That was Raymond's work. And, and purified proteins, uh, Mike Hollenstadt's work showed that uh, threonine uh, caused more rapid GTPG GTPG protein binding. Uh, we did some transfected cell work. The threonine signaled more in transfected cells with the, than the, the threonine versus the alanine. And then we downloaded a bunch of stroke data that had genotype information and found that in this sign study, this threonine 120 variant was associated with ischemic stroke. Uh, it was a weak signal. And those papers are uh, from our group and from Mike Hollenstadt's group uh, down here. Now, there's limitations to all these studies. <clears throat> Small numbers of human studies. And so confounding variables were not able to be considered. There were 10 and 12. Those were the sorts of numbers of subjects that were studied. Uh, the purified proteins are, you know, the limit is they're not in cells, and, and uh, 293 cells are not platelets. And in terms of this genetic epi study, the limitation was this was a whites-only analysis, and it was not prospective. So no predictive capacity there. And it was a little complicated downloading all these public databases from lots of different institutions. It might not have been so clean, even though we didn't have anything to do with that other than downloading it. We did see a signal. In other words, there was no direct experimental evidence that this variant altered ex vivo platelet function or in vivo thrombosis. And there was no prospective human study of the variant for uh, stroke risk. So our goals were to generate a preclinical mouse model to test the functionality of the variant and to assess the benefit of antiplatelet drugs on stroke um, prevention. And lastly, those, that would, that's going to be a mouse study. And then we wanted to do a human study that also looked for stroke risk in, uh, in a black population. The caveats with the mouse model is that mouse PAR4 is structurally and functionally different than human PAR4. And uh, mice, of course, lack PAR1. Other people have tried to make put PAR1 in, in, in mice, and several labs have been unable to do it. So one of the nice things about being here is uh, this conference is focused on education and training, and I have been extraordinarily lucky to collaborate with one of uh, Alyssa Wahlberg's trainees, Robbie Campbell. And uh, He's just been a terrific collaborator. Um, and, and this, Robbie was the major uh, force in, in generating these mice. And the strategy was to replace mouse PAR4 using CRISPR with the human PAR4, two flavors, uh, and, uh, uh, adenine guanine. And these are, and, and then we get a humanized mouse. These are primers that we used to make sure we had the right junctions. We characterize these mice up the wazoo. That's a real scientific term. 
I'm not going to go through all this data, uh, but just to say we did whole genome sequencing, confirmed the correct site in one copy, confirmed the junctions were correct, the, we had the G to A substitution, we did QRTCPR on a number of brain tissues, and, and, I, and, point, and I'll point out that the strategy kept the mouse regulatory elements driving the expression of the gene. So we were expect we wanted a model where all tissues would express PAR4 um, that, that normally did. <clears throat> and we found similar levels between the alanine and the threonine mice. Um, we then back crossed them, bred the hets to get homozygotes. And not, again, not going to show you this, but the hematologic analyses showed that both lines had similar CBCs, platelet count, half-life, platelet half-life, and platelet EM morphology, granule number, and granule content as assessed by fibrinogen PF4. I am going to show you one piece of raw data, which is probably the most important, which is protein. <clears throat> and uh, this is a Western from platelets, uh, alanine, alanine platelets, and threonine, threonine platelets. This is the summary in a bar graph form, and there was no significant difference in platelet PAR4 protein. And here's functional data. And what we found was that with low agonist stimulation, shown in these two panels, uh, 250 micromolar AYP, which is specific for PAR4, and low dose thrombin, 0.25 units per ml, there was a difference. This is recapitulating the human data, but uh, the only difference here is a, one nucleotide between the two animals. However, at higher doses, this difference could be overcome. Uh, and this, these bar graphs summarize this representative data up here. You see a difference at low-dose uh, AYP and low-dose thrombin, but it's lost. Another important control we did, our goal was to do an in vivo stroke model. Um, we're putting in the human gene, <laughs> but we didn't know that mouse thrombin might activate the human gene. So that's why we did this. Um, and indeed, mouse thrombin, these are ex vivo studies of the mouse platelets. And uh, not only does mouse thrombin activate the platelets, but we again saw the threonine uh, uh, effect of higher aggregation. So, what I also have not shown is there was no genotype effect on collagen-induced aggregation. Um, and we did other assays, flow cytometry, P-selectin expression, PS exposure, PAC1 binding, uh, yeah, PAC1 binding, not John A, human. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was John A. We were activating through PAR4. But other, other measures of platelet activation were similar to the aggregation I showed up, up above. And there were similar tail bleeding times between the two strains. So now the next key player in doing all the work is Frederick de Norm, who is a tremendous, uh, he was a postdoc at the time, he's now junior faculty at the University of Utah. And uh, Frederick was using what's uh, the best game in town as far as uh, animal models of stroke, which is the transient middle cerebral artery occlusion model, um, which recapitulates many aspects of human ischemic stroke, including the injury uh, or the ischemic reperfusion injury, disrupted blood vein barrier, and territorial infarction. What Frederick does is this is, these are the key vessels in the brain, and in the middle cerebral artery, he inserts a filament which occludes the vessel and uh, induces a stroke when you subsequently section the brain. And this is the strategy here. We take our two strains. He puts in the filament for a variable period of time. This, uh, the first set of experiments is 40 minutes, then removes the filament that's the reperfusion phase, and 24 hours later measures these outcomes. Stroke, platelet function, brain inflammation, net formation. All of these studies were blinded as to genotype. And this is what was found. These are brains from four of each genotype. 
The pale area is the infarcted region, shown by the dotted lines. And the threonine mice had larger volume strokes <clears throat> significantly. These are functional assays. I'm not going to show them in the rest of the talk. But they always correlated with stroke uh, volume, infarct volume. The first is a Breederson assay, uh, which measure, uh, mice run around in circles or not, and they score various aspects of their behavior. And the grip test is exactly what it sounds like. They're allowed to grip on something, and how long can they do it, or can they do it at all? And so this means that they had worse functional outcomes on the Breederson and better grips. Uh, I'm sorry, worse grips <laughs> uh, on the grip test. So not only uh, stroke volume, but functional assays. Then Frederick took the brains and measured uh, stain for neutrophil recruitment. And there were increased neutrophils and nets in the threonine mice, as shown, at least neutrophils here. The white box shows the red is stain for MPO neutrophil marker. And there's more in the uh, threonine. And then he stained for nets. And similarly, the threonines had more, uh, that would be red plus green is yellow, more net formation. That data is summarized in these bar graphs. So more neutrophils in the threonine mice and more uh, nets in the threonine mice. <clears throat> um, so the question might be, is it platelets or neutrophils? Is there a PAR4 in neutrophils? We know there is in platelets. Um, so we looked at, we took mouse platelets, um, uh, mouse blood and purified the uh, platelets and neutrophils and add, the, add them together and do these studies to see if we could make ex vivo nets, which we can. Convulsin didn't uh, show a genotype effect. However, uh, when you stimulate through PAR4, you do, shown here. Then I'm still not telling you whether it's platelets or neutrophils. But we've concluded, uh, in data not shown, that, that the, you could get, the only way you could get uh, neutrophils to make nets ex vivo was in the presence of platelets that had been activated. You didn't, you didn't uh, get them otherwise. So, unless you use PMA. <laughs> um, after uh, this model, compared to the alanine mice, after the stroke model, the threonine mice had more brain PMNs and more brain nets. Uh, didn't show it, but there were also more circulating platelets with PAR4, uh, actually in the mice, I just did show it. We also did it in humans, that's the next slide. Um, PAR4 inducible platelet neutrophil aggregates uh, and net formation. So that's mice. The question is, might this also happen in humans, um, net formation? So we purified human, well, we took humans, genotyped them. It's hard to get a lot of threonine homozygotes, especially in Salt Lake City, because <laughs> you need to have a... Uh, uh, the allele frequency is modest or low in whites. So we grouped the threonines as either heterozygous or homozygous. There were a couple of homozygous and compared uh, seven alanine homozygous to any one or two copies of threonine. And when we took purified neutrophils, purified platelets, there was no difference when they were resting. When we activated PAR4, uh, they made more nets. So human platelets also do the same thing, and there's a genotype effect uh, based on threonine. So the question is, does, now this has been mice. What about humans? This is where uh, Mary Cushman helped us, because she's an investigator in the REGARD study, Reason for Geographical and Racial Differences in Stroke. It's a longitudinal study of incident stroke with more than 30,000 black and white adults in the U.S. followed for more than 10 years. Importantly, there had been no, there were, none of them had a baseline stroke. 
almost 8,000 blacks had had um, both genotype and stroke data. And then they were evaluated, you know, strokes are a little more complicated than MI because there's a bunch of types. And we did, we analyzed all strokes combined, cardioembolic only, large athro, uh, large artery athro, small vessel, and then other and unknown. And these are the results of this work. There were, and it was a case control analysis with 488 cases in over 7,000 controls. We used the A allele, which encodes the threonine, as the risk factor. <clears throat> and we looked at additive, recessive, and dominant models. We, the, there was no signal in the dominant model. Shown here is the additive and recessive. And when you combine all the strokes, we had the biggest numbers, 488. Uh, when you adjust for simply uh, age, sex, and ancestry, there was a significant uh, effect of the, the variant in both additive and recessive models. When you also adjust for smoking, hypertension, and diabetes, you still have a significance and a trend in that recessive model. There was a puny signal in small vessel, but we're not making much of that because the numbers were small. And then we did functional analysis. There were fewer cases here because not as many people had that kind of functional analysis. So there were 270. But the results held pretty similar. Um, that especially significant in the recessive model, but um, the additive also looked a little uh, like there was an effect. So now we're going to move back to mice because we want to do things you can't do uh, to humans, which was ask uh, about antiplatelet therapy. So we used the same system uh, Frederick did. The ischemia was 60 minutes, and there's a reason for that. I can explain it if, if you want. But this is also a commonly used time point. And again, at 24 hours after reperfusion, we measured the same outcomes. This is a cartoon of the FDA-approved antiplatelet drugs. There's five or so classes there, but we looked at P2I12 blockers. Jeez, this is sensitive. And uh, NSAIDs, uh, commonly used antiplatelet drugs to prevent recurrent stroke. And what we found was that Frederick gavaged these mice and gave them P2I12 uh, blockers with uh, using ticagrelor, and this improved the stroke outcome in the alanine homozygote mice. You can see, uh, again, here's the stroke volumes, which are smaller uh, in, in, than when they didn't get treated, vehicle versus P2I12 blockade. However, <laughs> we didn't see the same thing in the threonine homozygote mice, shown here. Uh, their, their stroke volume did not change and was not benefited by P2I12 blockade. So the question then becomes, well, maybe we should use a, lot, a higher dose of blockade, or maybe we should add a, a, a aspirin. Mm -hmm. Dual antiplatelet therapy is often used in these settings. Didn't help. So, and this is just the threonine mice. We'd already gotten benefit in the alanine, so we were focusing on what can we do to help the threonine mice. Higher amounts of ticagrelor didn't help, and neither did dual antiplatelet. To refresh your memory and sort of what the thinking was uh, at the time, I already showed this. It shows ticagrelor didn't improve stroke volume. But when we counted neutrophils in the brain, uh, it, there was no significant difference either. So ticagrelor didn't really reduce the number of neutrophils, nor the number of nets. So it, it didn't affect thromboinflammation in the brain. But it did effectively block P2I12 and platelets. So we were using the right dose. These are ex vivo platelet analyses from the mice that got ticagrelor and stimulated with to me's ADP so that this was through P2Y12. And it was the expected result. So that was a little confusing. It appears that in the, thrombi, uh, the threonine mice, 
no benefit, but you inhibit platelet function. Begging the question, what about hemorrhage? It turns out that in the threonine mice, if you give them ticagrelor, you have more hemorrhagic transformation. You give more ticagrelor, you have worse bleeding. Dual antiplatelet, you also have more bleeding. These, th these are, this is the brain after dual antiplatelet just on the surface, and, and on the right here are sections, and the arrows are pointing to these microbleeds throughout the brain. So it kind of looks like uh, P2Y12 COX inhibition may produce harm, but no benefit in these PAR4 threonine homozygote mice. So I showed this before, and we then wanted to ask, well, gee, if we could interrupt this interaction, might that benefit the threonine mice? Well, it turns out that there is a, a way to do that uh, with a P-selectin blockade. And, and indeed, what we found is that when we administered P-selectin blockade to these threonine mice, the stroke volume went down, and the functional assays improved. Uh, Frederick also stained the brain tissue, and the asterisks are pointing to nets, a little hard to see in these upper panels, but there's more here and less after P-selectin blockade. The green boxes are blown up right in the lower panels, and it's a little easier to see that there were more nets here. That was quantified here. There's fewer neutrophils <clears throat> in the threonine mice after P-selectin blockade and fewer nets. So to summarize, mouse strains with the alanine threonine were generated. The threonine mice have hyperreactive platelets. And in the murine, uh, oops, there's a typo, uh, TMCAO model of stroke, they had worse ischemic uh, outcomes and more brain PMNs and nets. Standard antiplatelet therapies in the threonine mice did not improve stroke outcome and increase brain bleeding. P-selectin blockade improved stro stroke outcomes in the threonine mice. Um, and in, in summary, the human PAR4 has a functional variant, and the th threonine variant is a risk for incident ischemic stroke, and worse outcomes in humans. Not sure I am on time, but lastly, my uh, uh, implications. So um, a number of years ago, Kanataga published this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine where they had given a P-selectin blockade to sickle cell disease patients and showed that it improved uh, there's uh, re reduce their sickle pain crises. This is a cartoon. This is the uh, crizanlizumab <laughs> molecule. We call it Criz. Um, easier to remember and say. And it uh, binds to P-selectin and blocks its interaction with uh, neutrophils as well as uh, leukocyte interaction with endothelial cells. Um, shown here it was a study that showed that CRIS uh, inhibited leukocyte migration when onto P-selectin. So this panel got CRIS. And the late, great Paul Frenette um, showed a number of years ago that heme-induced neutrophil extracellular traps contribute to the pathogenesis of sickle cell disease. So we're thinking um, Stroke is a real problem for sickle cell disease, especially kids uh, and who are burdened by stroke. 90% of them are silent. So I went online looking for a, a, a stroke study where patients were being put on uh, this P-selectin blocker and said, ooh, maybe we want to study those. Turns out a friend of mine at WashU uh, was part of a study that was doing exactly that uh, Andrea Ford is a neurologist, a, neuro, a neurologist who's got an interest in stroke and sickle disease, and she had a study uh, where she was measuring a number of outcomes, uh, and so we had an opportunity to look at some platelet function studies before and after CRIS, which I then called another friend 
at WashU, Jorge de Paula, and we have now been able to, to study three patients. You can imagine these are not, they're, they're hard to find. Um, and this is the initial data. Each, this is platelet neutrophil aggregates that were measured by flow cytometry. These are three patients. Green is after CRIS. And you see that in all cases, uh, they went down from before CRIS. This is basal integrin activation, alpha 2B beta 3, basal P selectin. A little harder to explain the last, but maybe there's some uh, feedback uh, mechanism. But it's hard to get a statistics on this because there's so much variation at baseline. So we tried saying, well, if we just look at the fold change before and after, might that get us anywhere? And you know, the, the PNA data looks like it's statistically significant, as does this data, as does this. So uh, we'll see where we go with this, but um, it's going to be challenging to really get a stroke outcome uh, in, in this kind of a setting because there just won't be that many patients. But maybe a combined uh, outcome of sickle complications might help. So the implications and the summary of that is that for sickle stroke patient, no, I'm sorry, this is for ischemic stroke patients, I'll get to sickle later, for ischemic stroke patients with the A allele, P-selectin blockade may provide clinical benefit, never been looked at. Aspirin and P2I12 blockade may do more harm than good, never been looked at <laughs> in, with, with this genotype. We need greater diversity in all cardiovascular disease trials because, you know, m most of the MI studies include maybe 2% black individuals. It's getting better, but it's still, it's still an issue. And it would be lovely to do, in my opinion, pharmacogenetic analyses on existing data sets of sickle patients. Um, number one, to look if you dichotomize by genotype, uh, might aspirin and, well, antiplatelets be shown not to help in the threonine sickle patients and maybe only benefit the alanines. Um, and that Ataga study used two doses of CRIS. Uh, the lower dose seemed to help, but maybe not as much. So the patients are now given the higher dose. And maybe if they were heterozygote, they could get away with a lower dose. Um, so that is, uh, and, we'd, and we'd love to probe some big database and genotype for outcomes. We're trying, but it's been hard. So that's all I have to say. Any questions? Questions? Thank you for that talk. Um, I was just wondering, is the brain level for neutrophils the same as a serum level? You mean? Like you talk about the, the brain, the neutrophils in the brain. Is that level the same as when you just draw blood? You know, there was no difference. Well, I shouldn't. I'm sure we looked at the white count in patient or in the in the uh, mice. Um, I don't really, really remember the answer to that. Uh, I mean, the only way that you know it would have to be higher in the three and it wasn't higher at baseline. There was no difference at baseline. Post stroke, would the blood level be higher? I don't remember if this, that's been done. Certainly what was in the brain uh, was, and we did, we did play with neutrophil aggregates in the blood and some more play with neutrophil aggregates. I, I don't believe the brain neutrophils reflected a difference in circulating leukocytes, but I have to double check. Is that your question? If the white count's higher and in the blood, would it also be higher in the brain, so it's not necessarily a genotype effect? 
And does this reaction happen no matter what neutrophil level you have? Or do you have to have a normal neutrophil well, level? Well, uh, there's only mice. Um, I, I think people heard the question, not, not any answer. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so we only looked at mice. We, didn't, we don't know the answer in humans because we don't have neutrophils in the brain in humans. Um, but I think my recollection is we saw no significant change in neutrophil level between control and stroke mice in the peripheral blood white count. Maybe I'm not answering your question. Well, you answered my first question. The second question is, does this reaction between the platelets and neutrophils happen when the neutrophils are low? Don't know. I would think that wouldn't matter, but you're going to have less going into the brain if you start with a, less, a lower level in the peripheral blood. But with uh, neutrophil activation and disruption of the blood-brain barrier and platelets involved in all of that, the platelets in the, in the neutrophils are coming from the blood and they're migrating into the injury in the brain. Um, and platelets facilitate that neutrophil migration into the brain. But I, I, I'll have to look at the blood count neutrophil levels. Up here. That was, that was Jill, right, yeah. That was most interesting. That was great. So you mentioned diversity, and this is, of course, a, a fan, fantastically important topic. So in the... <clears throat> of patients and trials and so on, in... Um, were there equal male females in the study, looking at the the distribution of the um, threonine allele mutations? Um, like, if you just do a genomic uh, analysis, I, I would doubt that there were equal number of males and females as cases because mm. it's more common in men. Mm. But at least we statistically, the statistical analysis adjusted for sex. Okay, right, and. With respect to sickle cell, I believe that's a, uh, a protective factor against malaria. And so in malaria endemic regions, just by genomic analyses, is there a change in distribution between the alanine and threonine mutation there? Yeah. The threonine is more common. Yeah, okay. So, so we actually, there's another uh, project in Dr. Campbell's lab and uh, the, the postdoc working on it, Arena, uh, took, our, took the alanine, threonine mice, gave them malaria, and there was no difference in outcome. Huh. So threonine did not protect oh, okay. against right. malaria also... in our animal model. Yeah. yeah. Have you made a, serine to, uh, a threonine to serine mutation, for instance? I'm sorry? Have you made a, serine to, uh, a threonine to serine mutation? Subtracted? I... Don't know anything about a serine mutation. No, I'm just wondering. If, if, well, it's a similar um, amino acid, right? The hydroxyl just down a bit. So I'm just wondering if you've done a mutational analysis. No. 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 Um, hi, Paul. Uh, good talk. So, do you think that it matters what the composition of the thrombus is in terms of the outcome and the ischemia reperfusion, etc.? Because I saw a talk a week ago that um, basically uh, you can go from a very red cell fibrin rich uh, thrombus in the, in the brain to very platelet and VWF rich thrombi. Um, and part of that has to do with where they originate, of course, that if you have a erosion of a carotid plaque, uh, that is more likely to be platelet rich. If you embolize from the uh, atrium, during AFib, I think it's more likely to be fibrin and red cell rich. Do you think there's any difference between those? You know, I, I have no data to really answer that question, and we haven't looked at clock composition because, in particular, this model, you know, it uses a filament to cause the ischemia as opposed to a thrombus. Um, but I'm trying to think of other things we've done ex vivo 
But nothing that's really looked at microthrombi composition. So uh, you know there there are there is more PS when we take alanine uh, homozygote, threonine homozygote, human platelets, and assess uh, PS exposure with agonists. There's always more PS on the threonine human platelets. Whether that means you're going to get a different composition to your clot, somebody else might have to answer that. I have a follow-up. So um, in your model, you have the middle cerebral artery occluded. What percentage of human strokes occur in situ like that? Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, an awful lot are lacoons, which are the really t small vessel, quite small vessel. Middle cerebral would be considered large. We haven't done any other models like a carotid. Um, so middle cerebral is probably intermediate sized. So I, I don't know. I imagine it's not trivial. Um, when we I went over that table pretty quickly on the regard study. I went over it really quickly. <laughs> There's a lot of numbers there. The second column, when we looked at all of them, we had a signal. The second column, we took out thromboembolic, uh, thromboembolic the cardioembolic ones, and we still saw a signal. We took them out because the thinking was that the pathophysiology might be a little different. But we still had a signal. Um, I'm not, that's really not answering your question, but there, there was still a trend in all the others. And when we did this other study on a whites-only analysis, um, we saw the same thing. But I don't know how many are middle cerebral. Hi, that was a really cool talk. I'm a PhD student in Wolfgang Bergmeier's lab. Um, there's some, <coughs> excuse me, some investigation into, uh, and I'm sorry if you um, already went over this, but there's some investigation into um, neutrophil um, invasion into the vasculature, um, causing some inflammation. Um, so I kind of have a two-part question. Um, have you looked at markers of inflammation and like maybe um, uh, vascular barrier function, and also have you analyzed um, GP6 collagen contribution to the formation of these um, clots? Mm, I'd say no and no. Um, <clears throat> short, short answer, but certainly not your second. The answer is no to your second question. The first one was uh, about uh, uh, neutrophil invasion and inflammation. Not into the vessel itself. Is that what you're referring to? Not into the vessel itself. It's really more brain tissue. But you know, you do disrupt blood-brain barrier, and these cells extravasate after the injury, and they're coming from the blood. So that's the reason I ask is because if you maybe if you're getting some of that destruction, you get exposure of um, the subendothelium and collagen, which would be GP6 mediated. Yeah. So so I would also just add, and that that's a good point, but. Remember, this is a global <laughs> mouse change, and we haven't at all excluded that this is an endothelial cell effect on the brain injury. Um, and I have reason to suspect that might be an issue. 